million dollar dollar bond on Monday uh, on 1.7 billion dollars of orders. So there's still interest in China debt, but I think we're mm. going to see greater differentiation going forward between the strong and weak hands in China. Before we get there, do we see contagion? No, but we're probably expecting something on the order of a 60 to 70 percent recovery for dollar bondholders because I just don't think that the company is going to be able to deliver on these non-core assets. So they really don't. What's happening, everybody? Uh, not sure if everybody can see the screen and hear me, but we are live and we should be live. Um, let's take a look here. Oh, what's going on, King Julian? It's been a while since I've done these live streams, so I figured I'd come on live for maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half. We'll see how long it takes for Coinbase to finally, um, you know, go live and start trading. What's up? What's up? What's going on? Uh, perfect. Perfect. Let me actually turn this on. Perfect. So. Not yet, not yet. We're still waiting. So this right here is going to be the Coinbase, again, ticker symbol C-O-I-N, um, Coinbase Global. And on Webull, you guys will notice it's sitting at $250. That's the reference price. We'll kind of see where it opens. Right now, there's rumors about $340 price target. So, uh, you know, that's well, that was the last price that was reported by Bloomberg that I was watching. Coinbase, so right here, if you guys will notice over here, here, let me do that. So Coinbase is indicated to open at $340 in NASDAQ debut. So we're, we'll see where that price actually sits. Um, again, there's going to be people at the floor at the uh, New York Stock Exchange basically bidding that stock price up, uh, depending on where it trades. Of course, 250 is just a reference price. It never basically trades at that level. So good morning, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good evening, wherever you guys are watching from. And uh, $350 indication, yes, that's right. So $340, $350. Uh, again, I mentioned under $300 is kind of like my preferred buy target. Um, it's a very, very difficult, almost impossible to get it close to like the reference price. Um, I think Roblox was one of the stocks that very recently IPO'd. Their reference price was $40 or I think $45. And they ended up opening at like $60 or something, right? So that's going to be ticker symbol RBLX. Um, and now they're trading at well over $78. So... I think they open, let's take a look. So they open at $64, so $64.50, and their reference price was around $40.45. Um, so we'll see where Coinbase, Coinbase Global actually opens. So Bitcoin almost at near all-time highs. This right here is going to be the technical analysis that I was able to do on a very, very rough sort of way. So a trend line it's been respecting consistently is going to be this level right here. So that's the higher lows, form some type of a symmetrical triangle here, a huge breakout back to this old resistance as a new support here before pushing higher. And now we're just starting to form this kind of like a wedge. Um, and it's now trading at well over $63,000 uh, per coin. So what is your guys' opinion on this? I want to I wanna have you guys comment as well. So let me know what you guys think for um, for Coinbase, right? What is your price target? Do you have one? Do you think it's overvalued at 340? Um, are you investing in it? I wanna know from you guys, right? So what are your thoughts on this? Would love to know. So quick market update. So we are down uh, for the NASDAQ. So the NASDAQ is down a little bit over 38 basis points. Again, that's normal considering that we have seen the NASDAQ really rally the past few, few days or like a few weeks. Uh, Apple is down slightly over 80 basis points. Neo, of course, struggling to catch a bit here, down about almost 2%. And Tesla also down over 88 basis points. So what did I mention yesterday for Tesla? I said that we are potentially going to see a gap up tomorrow and then a red candle, right? Similar to what we saw here when Tesla rallied over 19, 20%. And then we had a gap up the following day and then a sell off. So again, $780 was a resistance. If you guys did get a chance to watch my video from last night, I put that out for both Tesla and Neo. I mentioned 780, 785 is gonna be the level to watch. Um, and you know, what do you know? $780 high of the day. So what do you guys think about um, what do you guys think about Coinbase? Because this video is about Coinbase, we're gonna talk about it at quite length. Um, Again, very, very excited to find out where it actually starts trading because this is one of those companies I haven't been very, very excited about an IPO in a long time because Roblox, it was a great company. I wasn't really uh, interested in it. Robinhood also, like they are going to potentially do it, but Coinbase, I'm more so excited about it uh, because it kind of fits the realm of the companies that I, I like to analyze, like from a tech standpoint and kind of like those forward looking companies that are going to benefit from you know, the digitization of finances and a lot of other services as well that they're going to be doing. So good morning, good morning, everybody. So thank you so much for joining in. Let's take a look at what Bloomberg is doing right now. So they're talking about something else. We'll kind of go over. 
yeah, we'll kind of circle back to that. And by the way, the targets are also out. So this is something that I was able to find. So Coinbase Global, there's three analysts offering a 12 month price target on Coinbase. 460 is the median target with a high estimate of $600 per share. So if you guys did get a chance to watch my video that I put out literally like four hours ago, I wanna say I put out this spreadsheet, right? Going over the different price targets um, for, for Coinbase, right? These right here are gonna be the different prices um, and $250, of course, is the reference price right over here. Um, and 65 billion market cap at 400, we're sitting at well over $100 billion market cap. At 340, 350, we're sitting at roughly over $80 billion market cap, trading at 65 times 2020 price to sales and 251 2020 price to earnings. Um, but here's the interesting thing. Q1 was such a blowout quarter because Bitcoin was you know, literally at an all time high. Um, trading volume increase literally exploded. Like that was an explosion of volume, right? Coming in from Q4 of 2020 to Q1, um, we've seen Bitcoin rally and the trading volume, institutional uh, interest, retail interest, all having a huge spike. So whether this is sustainable, that's open for debate, right? We're gonna see those cyclical moments where uh, Bitcoin's price is gonna stabilize a little bit, right? We're gonna see trading volume stabilize a little bit. Um, and it's with every every stock and every security, right? We're gonna see kind of like um, stabilize from a cyclicality standpoint. So, you know, on a more aggressive sort of projection, 7.2 billion is what I was forecasting for 2021. If you simply take Q1, multiply that by four times. But even if you cut that revenue down by 50%, right? Let's just say that from 1.8 billion in Q1 2021, they literally just do another 1.8 rest of 2021, right? That's that's gonna be 1.8 divided by three. So that's gonna be roughly $600 million in revenue is what they do in Q2, Q3, Q4. Now, those are very, very conservative estimates considering that the company is still very, very driven by transaction revenue. So, so those basically give us some reasonable multiples that we can find our sweet spots. Again, 300 or below was kind of like my preferred target. Between 300 and 400 is kind of like, you know, it's still attractive, but it's like still paying a little bit of a premium in the short term um, for that company. Um, and then anything over 400 is like, you know, it's not worth chasing it. Yeah, I mean, it's somewhere between 11 a.m. and noon is what everyone is expecting for Coinbase to actually start trading at. Um, so we'll see. I mean, pretty much the whole process is, you know, there's going to be buyers and sellers at, uh, you know, at the at the floor. And basically, that's what the bids are, what's going to determine the opening price, right? The opening trade is what's going to happen. And we'll probably even catch it on Bloomberg if they actually go over that. Usually they do. But we'll see when that happens. So right now it's uh, a little bit past 11 a.m. Eastern. Again, very very excited uh, to really, um, you know, see where it opens. Um, you can check the bids and the and the asks on Weeble. So it's not showing up yet. I have the order book here. I've got the stuff over here. It's not showing up anything uh, for for the company. You know, so 250. It still says over here. It shows the price to earnings 144. Uh, the 12 month trailing um, and other than that it doesn't really give us any data right it just it's sitting there uh, but other than that let's take a look at some of the other stocks right GameStop up over 12% we got AMC up over 8 um, Nano actually let's go over to all stocks so uh, alright so we got Wayfair Microvision Exxon Mobil Wells Fargo so again some of those value trades picking up again it's no surprise because TAC has rallied uh, the past couple of weeks, so Tesla is down a little bit over 1.3. Palantir is down. They've got the demo day uh, later today as well. Actually, it's supposed to start at 11 a.m. Eastern, so they should be. It should already be underway. Um, then Amazon is down. AMD is down. So we'll see. We'll see if we see any type of tech kind of rebounding. But everyone, good afternoon, good morning. Thank you so much for joining. It's a little bit past 8:30 p.m. here, um, my time, and we'll, and we'll see if uh, we can get we can get that uh, show going and for Coinbase. So let's take a look at how many people we have here. So we've got a little bit over 153 people. Again, make sure that you guys drop a like. It really, really means the world to me. It helps out the channel in a tremendous way.
But yeah, I'm, I'm interested to find out what you guys are looking for. Are you guys investing in Coinbase or are you guys staying away from it? Are there specific price targets? Are you bullish on the stock over the long term? Are you bullish on the company? So Hub says I'm not buying, but it has a really sick app. All right, let's take a look at, so Bitcoin is still above over 63,000. Let's take a look at some of those other plays here. Um, let's take a look at Palantir. So Palantir is down a little bit uh, over 1.1, 1. 1. 1, but it's still holding above $25, right? 25 is the key level of support. Uh, so on CBC, Coinbase at 350, staying away. Thank you for this live. Yeah, so again, very, very excited to find out where it opens. Uh, let's see if we can actually find that. Um, it should already be on there. For the demo day. Oh, wait, hold on. Join us at 14th. Yeah, I, sh I already did register for it. I Let me see if I got an email. You'll have to find that email to actually pull that up. Till then, we can just look at some of the other stocks here very quickly. So Apple's still struggling and Neo is still down a little bit over 2%. AMD is down, Twitter, Nvidia, Amazon. And we got Square almost down 3% as well. 300 or below seems juicy, yeah. So I definitely agree. I mean, if it comes down below 300, um, that's kind of like a sweet spot there for for Coinbase. And and even if you take into account like very conservative projections, right? If you take the transaction revenue out of the equation or even make it so like it very minimal, 25% growth year over year for the next like three years, 2022, 2023, 2024, we, you know, we get reasonable revenues and EPS for us to consider it at a PE of about 60 and then we're looking at a $726 price target by 2024 uh, with a 90% upside, considering the stock is starting at $400 per share. So, yeah, it's concerning. Yep, definitely agree that the fact that a lot of the revenue comes off of transaction fees. Uh, yep, so if they do commission free, so that's when, that's when you have to take into account well, how quickly is the company going to pivot and focus on other services, other sort of like lending, storing, um, other business models, right? So if you come over here, let's take a look at Coinbase very quickly. Um, so this right here was the complete analysis, right? So we're gonna take this out. So again, if you were to kind of fast forward, so this is the way they actually make money, right? So transaction revenue is the biggest piece, sending, receiving, investing, and spending. Um, but then subscription and services revenue is like paying, distributing, storing, va uh, storing value, borrowing, lending, building, saving, and this doesn't even make up for you know majority of the revenue. It's like four or five percent, if that, for the company's revenue. Um, but the but the interesting thing is that even though Bitcoin's price didn't really do much from like I want to say Q1 of 2018, so you'll notice that Q1 2018 the monthly transacting users actually went down substantially. Like there wasn't much trading volume for the company, so this right here is going to be assets on the platform. It was it wasn't really doing much uh, from from this perspective. Like look over here, trading volume, right? This basically goes over um, the trading volume for. So trading volume for uh, Coinbase, right? And you'll notice that after Q1 2018, it's actually down, it's just flat, right? It, it didn't really do much. And you look at the verified users, it still was going up and it's been on a consistent growth here, 
like you'll notice, regardless of what quarter it was, they just consistently added more and more and more people to their platform. So that definitely does represent that there's some, some proposition, some value there, other than just trading, buying, selling uh, cryptocurrencies um, for Coinbase. So that, that, you know, that's a very valid point that transaction revenue is huge for the company. And if in the future, uh, trading volume comes down or anything happens, so like we can make a very good comparison here. So you'll notice how from Q, it's Q2 of 2019, let's take a look. So Q2 of 2019 here, um, 17 billion in institutional volume, 14 billion retail, it went down to 16 billion institutional, 11 billion retail, and look what happened to the revenues, right? Went from 210 million to 158 million. So we're talking about this over here. So this line item over here, if you guys to look at it, so went from 210 million to 158 to 98 million, right? So that's quarter over quarter, it's actually going down. So that, so obviously that's like decelerating revenues going down. Why? Because this right here, Q2, Q3, uh, and Q4 of 2019, the volume is going down. So it really depends how quickly the company can pivot, um, you know, to other services because it's 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 a kind of a derivative right now because it's it's deriving its value from another asset class um, and of course 1.8 billion like a monstrous quarter because because trading volume exploded Q4 in 2020 going into Q1 uh, of 2021 and another another really interesting piece is that their share of the crypto market right so 11% is nothing small like that is pretty big of a of a, of a share here. Uh, let's take a look. So we don't want to miss out on that. So 250 is still over here, still nothing on Webull. Let's take a look at trading view. Nothing here as well. And yeah, I was going over the price targets as well. So three analysts offering a 12-month price target forecast on Coinbase, have a median target of 460 with a high estimate of $600 per share. So 600 will put us well over 130 billion market cap. Like if I were to put 600 here, $156 billion market cap. What do you guys think about that? High estimate of 600, $156 billion market cap. And the low estimate is 440. So even the low estimate is much higher than the reference price and the pre-bid that we're seeing on Coinbase right now. Hmm, that's interesting to know as well. We'll see. I mean, uh, today I don't expect the Nasdaq or any stock per se to be correlated with the with Coinbase IPO. I mean, it's gonna trade on its own. Um, it's one of the it's one of the bigger IPOs like we've seen in a while. I feel like. So I'm really excited about this. Uh, all right, let's take a look at some of the other markets here very quickly. So I'm gonna open up the select sector indices market. And Bitcoin, again, this is gonna be the daily chart. We're pulling back a little bit. Um, this is the wedge that we continue to kind of fill in. And uh, if I were to kind of add the RSI here, let me just quickly do that, because I wanna show you guys the uh, negative divergence that we're seeing. Um, and the reason is, again, very simple, because we are consistently just making higher highs here while the relative strength index, you'll notice it's making some lower highs, right? That's the only cause for concern I have in the short term for Bitcoin. Uh, because we are making, we're pushing higher, making new all-time highs on weaker and weaker strength. The relative strength isn't really there uh, for Bitcoin right now, so that's the only cause for concern I have. Ooh, Tesla now down over two percent, coming down to six forty-six. Let's take a look at our chart. Um, six twenty is kind of like the next support. We'll see if that level continues to hold, but definitely quite a bit of a drop after the almost nine percent push higher yesterday um, for for Tesla. Thank you, Hub. I really appreciate that. Uh, cheers to you too. Thank you so much. I, I really, really appreciate your support. So this right here is gonna be the um, select sector indices. We've got, let's take a look at the one, one day. 
want to make sure that I'm on the one minute chart here. All right, I'm going to keep it on much higher. So we're going to keep it around three, like 225, 285, 365, 465. So this, is a, this should basically cover it. Like we should open right here in the middle as soon as the market's open. Um, that's a great question. Something that we just covered. Uh, so the question is, what do you would think? Uh, what will happen to Coinbase when it's no longer able to charge its, um, in my opinion, very high commission fee percentage? Uh, so they'll need to pivot. They'll need to pivot over to their services subscription model, um, and that's what analysts need to price in, right? At what rate is that going to grow in the future? Because they do have over 46 million users, right? That's a lot of lot of users with a lot of volume. Uh, so they'll need to look into products like lending, saving, investing, different types of products as well in order for them to have that long-term trajectory uh, moving forward, right? Because they can't be dependent on just transaction revenue because that's really going to hurt the business if that is, if price competition happens, you know, if new commissions or new sort of brokerages enter the market and offer free commissions. Uh, the only drawback with investing in cryptos, at least as far as I know with PayPal and Robinhood, is that you can't really own or you don't have access to a digital wallet. You can simply just invest in cryptos, but you don't actually own it, right? So you can't really send or receive cryptos as opposed to having an account with Coinbase where you actually own your digital wallet. You have an address with them. Again, that's that's as far as I know personally um, about Coinbase and, and their involvement with cryptocurrencies versus PayPal and Robinhood and, and the Square app and so on and so forth. Um, so how long till the IPO? Somewhere between 11 and 12 is what the expected is. But again, these things almost never happen in time. So we'll see uh, when that happens. In the meantime, I'll always keep a close eye. All right, so three indicated 350 there. now. Um, I still think though we're a long way off, but at that kind of uh, price, you're looking at a valuation on a diluted basis of like 88 billion plus. So still enormous numbers that we're dealing with. Uh, we will definitely keep you updated uh, on that. We want to check in now at Bloomberg's first word news. Here is Ritika Gupta. Hey Ritika. Hi Alex. All right, President so says it's time for indicating $350 now. So earlier it was 340, now 350, um, indicating about an $88 billion market cap. So again, there's no surprises there. Um, so 83, 80, 80, 80, 88 billion on a fully diluted basis over there uh, for 350 price. So we'll see, we'll see where it opens. I mean, how, how many of you guys think? So, all right, let me know in the live chat, thumbs up if you guys think it's gonna close above 400, thumbs down if you guys think it's gonna close below 400 on the day. Regardless of where it opens, above 400 or below 400, what is going to be the close for Coinbase today? And we've only got like, you know, once it once it becomes live, we only got about three to four hours worth of trading. You know, I could only expect what the volume is going to look like. You know, for a three hundred and fifty dollars stock, you're talking two hundred and sixty one million total shares outstanding. Um, we really need to. Or, so, how many of them are actually going to the public float? Is a real question. Well, we can do the math here. So. Let's do a very quick math. My calculator is not working. Um, so we're going to put in 88 billion here very quickly. So that should do it. All right, so. All right, so we're going to do this divided by 350. So 251 million shares, yep. So 251 million shares will be what's gonna be available. Well, that's gonna be the valuation, right? So we need to find out how many shares are gonna be outstanding. So we got few people, 425, close to the 360. Down, thumbs down, thumbs up. <laughs> 441, under 400. I don't think there's gonna be an options chain either for this stock. I could be wrong, but I don't think there's an options chain. So it'll pull back to 325, it'll close at 410, 425. Wow, that's a really precise, 
prediction there. Um, I'm keeping an eye on it. That's a great question. So I'm keeping an eye on Coinbase. Uh, my preferred buy target is under 300. Um, and if it does like hover around over 350, 400 or over 400, it's it's trading at a very heavy premium. Um, you know, if you are long-term bullish and you fun if you fundamentally believe that cryptocurrency, more specifically Bitcoin, which makes up about 70% of the platform's assets, is gonna do well in the future, like over the course of the next two to five years, if it's going to, if you believe that it's going much, much higher and trading volume is gonna pick up as well, then yes, it would definitely make sense for you to pay that premium in the short term because Coinbase is gonna do really, really well over the long term. But it's, you know, it's kind of back and forth because for me, chasing that stock over 400 is like, I'm rather okay just patiently waiting for to see if it's gonna pull back in the short term rather than just paying that premium in the short term. <clears throat> Everyone's selling off Tesla to buy in Coinbase. Um, yeah, Tesla is down a little bit over 2.4% now. Neo just struggling, like just down over 3% now and Palantir also pulling back. The demo day is going on. Unfortunately, I'm not able to live stream that just yet because um, I did register for the event, but I didn't get the get the email for it, surprisingly enough, to join in. And Apple also pulling back. The entire market is. So Amazon's down a little bit over 1.4 AMD, Twitter, NVIDIA. NVIDIA has had a great run. Like how many of you guys have been investing in NVIDIA though? Like that stock has been on an absolute tear coming in from like 465, 470. I can't even believe that it was trading as low as like 465 like just a few weeks ago. Like this has been just absolutely incredible. Like almost a 35% gain here for NVIDIA. NVIDIA deserves it. Like it's a great, great company. Like you can't go wrong with NVIDIA in my opinion. <clears throat> so we'll keep a close eye at that as well. Weeble still showing 250. So Bank of America, so JP Morgan actually did, did report their earnings today. Um, there were a lot of banks that are gonna be reporting their earnings, right? So no chance it ends below 300. Um, coin will be over 600, my buy price 150. Peach on free. <laughs> Richard, I agree, two steps forward, one step back for Tesla. And you know, that's, that's exactly what we want from like a steady, a stable increase in prices. We don't want Tesla to literally just rally, rally like 25, 30% in a day. And then for us to kind of deal with that volatility and then the following day, just, you know, give up all those gains. We're more than happy to have like 2%, 3%, 4% gains intraday, pull back a little bit and then move back up onto the next leg up higher. So Scott, I'll take a look at the, that stock for sure. Uh, Trongs, I haven't really looked at it. Like I haven't even heard of that company. Is that how you spell it? Looking up on Trongs and run through the fundamentals? Is that is that like a stock? Is that? Felt it is too much inflated right now. Yeah, I mean, from some different metrics, you can make an argument that it is definitely a very overvalued. It's a bit of a stretch. Um, but again, we have to kind of look at the future earnings and what the company has the potential to do with that many users. Um, all right, so Coinbase, somebody says on trading 212 is 355. So Weeble still shows 250, Trading View still shows, I mean, it doesn't really show anything for Trading View just yet.
Ethereum will surprise Bitcoin. I, I agree. You know, for, to, for some extent, I, I believe that Ethereum has more returns to give to people than Bitcoin does. Um, for some reason, again, I, I have very limited understanding of crypto world. Um, again, if you guys have been part of this channel, it's been mostly stocks uh, that we've been covering from a fundamental technical standpoint. Haven't really covered cryptos, but I know that a lot of people have been requesting a technical analysis on Bitcoin, on Ethereum, a lot of the cryptocurrencies. If that's something that you are going to be interested in, just let me know in the comment section down below or let me know in the live chat as well so that I get a little bit more motivated in doing that in the future, knowing that there is demand for it, right? People want to see technical analysis on uh, cryptos. This was just a rough sort of Bitcoin analysis that I did, you know, respecting that higher lows on the daily chart, symmetrical triangle breakout, previous resistance acting as a new support here. So, which was going to be sitting at 42,400. So a couple of times we've actually seen that Bitcoin price dip. Um, and actually, let me add a couple of uh, moving averages as well. So we're going to moving average exponential. I'm going to move that to, all right. So we're going to put 21 here. And we're gonna just copy and paste this one, put in 50. So yeah, 50 EMA validated here, validated here a couple of times. It's been validating the 50 EMA pretty nicely for the for the past few times. Robinhood showing 250. Oh, ticker symbol TRX. All right, so we'll, we'll take a look at that. Bloomberg here. It is still definitely a travel and leisure basic resources, energy all leading the way higher. The DAX trading a little soft. We'll break down all the particulars. This is Bloomberg. All right, so we're still waiting. We'll see. Actually, Jerome Powell also speaks at 12 p.m. Eastern today. So in about 30 minutes, we're going to find out. Uh, I think it's going to be streamed on YouTube. I put out a video about that over the weekend. And then, of course, we got a lot of earnings this week for a lot of banks, institutions. The CPI report came out um, yesterday that we broke down. So let's take a look here. So this right here are gonna be the earnings and this right here is going to be the CPI report that we also broke down. So all of this was covered in the video so you guys are more than welcome to check that out. Um, so yeah, JP Morgan reported blue tear. It's down over 8%. Um, yeah, I mean, that was that was pretty warranted given the fact that it's been on a consistent new all-time highs, like literally on a tear coming in from like November 2020, right? It's up over almost 200%. All right, plus one on technical analysis on Bitcoin. Perfect. So we'll do that. Um, yeah, I will be watching double click event and doing an analysis on that after. Not watching that live just yet. I did register for it, but I didn't get the email, um, so I don't have access to the event just yet. But I will be watching the recorded version um, after, and I'll and I'll give my two cents. I'll share my opinion on it, and of course, the Palantir update will be posted as well as soon as the markets close. Uh, Tesla leaps. So Tesla, I am long-term bullish on Tesla as it is. Um, so right now it is pulling back. Uh, a little bit over 2%. Neo also struggling a little bit. And so is Apple. Um, and so is Palantir. Down about 2.5%. Now back down below 25. And Amazon is also pulling back a little bit. So uh, Tesla, long-term bullish uh, on the company, you know, over the course of the next 24 to 36 months, even as far as like 3 to 5 years. So my price target is well over a thousand dollars on Tesla. Um, I know it's 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 very conservative um, and it's also very aggressive depending on who you ask, right? Tesla, Palantir, some of those companies where there's always going to be debate: what's the fair valuation? What's the right price? You know, whether it's overvalued, undervalued, depending on how you look at it, right? <laughs> so, where are you guys joining in from? I want you guys to comment again. We do this almost every other live stream. Uh, but I'd love to hear where you guys are joining in from, right? Because that's the markets is what brings us together. So let me in the, let me know in the live chat where you guys are joining from, like what part of the world. 
right? So I'm currently in India. It's past 9 p.m. now, but always, always really excited and happy to kind of look at the markets with you guys, right? So it's always fun times. ST, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. So Canada, shout out to you guys. Seattle, England, Texas, Hong Kong. I do have plans of actually visiting Hong Kong very soon. We'll see. Like kind of finishing up with the East Coast, then I'll move back west. We'll see. Boston, been there for a couple of years. Great place. Shout out to Aaron. Italy, Hong Kong, Sweden, California. That's awesome. Singapore. I've been to Malaysia, not Singapore though. Canada, we'll be there soon too. Hopefully in the fall. We'll see. Fingers crossed. Los Angeles, uh, checking from Los Angeles. Awesome, awesome. South Korea, Slovakia. Wow, we got we got a lot of people here, so that's incredible. India too, that's awesome, that's great. Italy. <laughs> uh, we're still waiting for a coin to open. It's uh, potentially maybe around noon. We'll see, maybe around like another 30 minutes. GameStop on a rally here. Look at, look at GameStop, just absolutely pushing higher here Quebec Miami New York that's awesome it's incredible all right let's take a look at so everything's just been trading down right so it's been on on a lower high lower low pattern and we've just been pulling back Substantial coming in from like 1050 I want to say till like 1123 like this 30 minute period everything really sold off even more right aggressively <laughs> From Wall Street bets <laughs> So let's take a look at this. So when it comes to Coinbase, investors should tread carefully. I'm a little cautious on this IPO because the exchange's bid ask spreads. The difference between the buyers and the willing to pay for a given asset that sellers are willing to accept are so wide that going public could make a lofty valuation a bit of a stretch. Those spreads will come in just like stocks. So, but I think the valuation of over a hundred billion coming in, it's going to be hard to justify when consumers realize uh, that they want to compress spreads and make it more competitive. Yeah, so see, India is about to start banning trading and owning and mining of crypto. So that's a problem. Um, taking some of the capital flows away from Bitcoin, but yet the price pushing higher. Hmm, interesting. Target price seventy-five to ninety-five thousand range between nineteen and fifty percent of its current trading price. I want to keep a close eye on that as well. So, all right, it's, uh, yep, 11.35, still no Coinbase. Still at 2.50 uh, is what it's showing, but other platforms I believe are showing more than that. Let me take a look at some of the other ones here. So Coin also shows, um, Coin also shows 250. I mean, Robinhood. Excuse me. Robinhood also shows 250. 
Um, if you type in on Google, hmm. yeah, it doesn't really say anything. But has Coinbase started? Not yet. We're just looking at the looking at the uh, the trading view platform with Coin right there. <laughs> yeah, nice sell off for tech. Uh, somewhere between 11 and 12. So right now it's 11.36. I mean, that's the expectation. It could go well past 12 p.m. You know, well past 1 p.m. Who knows? I mean, it's it all depends on when they start trading, right? So, I mean, whatever happens is going to happen right here. Hopefully, TradingView is really good at uh, putting it instantaneously on there, the data. Um, and then I've also got Webull open, so you know one or the other. I'm expecting at least one of those platforms to have that right away, um, and for us to really understand, you know, what the price it opens at, um, the volatility, the volume, all those things, going to be very, very interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's a blank screen. Look at look at all the charts. Like every every chart that we've analyzed in the past has had data on it, right? This is like history. First candle first trade that's going to happen for Coinbase, one of the first cryptocurrencies companies going public on the NASDAQ. So exciting stuff. We can kind of browse around their financials for a little bit. Yeah, I think they had a little bit over $1 billion in cash. Yeah, cash and short-term investments a little bit over 4.9. Yeah, Fidelity says 250, Robinhood says 250, Webull says 250, and TradingView doesn't show anything, right? We don't have a single price. It says market open, but nothing. No volume, nothing. Meanwhile, we've got Bitcoin that is down a little bit over 1%. So, so I'm, I'm really curious to find out how this, moving forward and not just about today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually find out the correlation between Coinbase and Bitcoin, right? And the interesting thing is that, uh, so you know how in the past we've done QQQ divided by SPY? That's basically like, uh, on TradingView, you can use all these different like mathematical equations like you know to the power of multiply divide plus minus whatever um, and this actually whatever whenever you divide that by something it gives you a relative performance right it gives you relative performance of one index over another um, so I'm expecting like something very similar in the lines of this for when you divide coin divided by Bitcoin right the reason is because I want to find out how correlated they're going to be with each other. If you do QQQ divided by SPY, it gives you this line where it's just massive amount of underperformance right now, right? For the NASDAQ relative to the S&P 500. So very, very excited to find out the correlation between the two and how that actually works together. Yeah, so there's a lot of companies out there that actually are trading well below their pre-IPO price, right? Snowflake, I think, is still trading. Let me pull it up on a different chart. Results. Okay, so is that a thing of buy the rumor, sell the news kind of thing? Or is there something that we need to actually see in a catalyst? Well, I, I, I think... I, I think there was sort of expectations that the JP Morgan would do quite well, but I think they did better than expectations. So I, I'm not sort of... Hmm interesting event there <laughs> all right let's take a look at palantir over here because they've got the demo day events going on they're just kind of trading flat like right around 25 dollars so i'm i'm just i don't think there's going to be any yet there's not going to be any news yet that's kind of getting priced in because we're just hovering sideways the volume is still like relatively decent like yesterday, if you were to look at the price yesterday, we saw a spike 
in uh, Palantir, like immediately after, like I want to say like 1040 or something, like if you go over to the five minute chart, you'll notice that Palantir was kind of like back and forth, back and forth. And it wasn't until like 1 p.m., sorry, 140, that it actually started taking off with a lot of volume. You know what? We can also set alerts. So let me go ahead and set an alert price above 400, price below 300, and price above 500. Just set up another one. All right, and we're also going to do that for for this one right here. So we're going to go ahead and set alerts on Trading View. Hmm. So add an alert crossing. We're going to put four hundred. And we're gonna add a couple more alerts. What is some of the price? <laughs> yes, Bo, thank you so much. Make sure that you guys drop a like because it really helps out the channel in a tremendous way unless I forget. Um, so for Neo, everybody is asking about Neo. I mean, this is, if you guys have been keeping up with the channel, there's nothing new. Neo will potentially be weak for a little while uh, unless we see like those breakouts from those moving averages, right? So if you guys have been keeping up with the analysis, we're still like trading inside this uh, sort of like a downtrending channel, right? Like a descending pattern, and look, look, look exactly where we're getting rejected. Like, you know, this is this is crazy. We're getting rejected at the thirty nine dollar thirty three cents, but the twenty one EMA, so to speak. We did have push higher over thirty eight fifty. Now we're back down, so we're still we're still seeing weakness from the chart. So it's gonna take some time, and once we break out over those twenty one EMA, the fifty EMA, the moving averages, then we can see some more bullish sentiment from the stock. But right now, I mean. This is very normal, right? We need we need to give a new stock a little bit more time to kind of go sideways a little bit, consolidate, and then break out to the upside like we saw with Tesla. All right, um, so HMBL. So, all right, let me take a quick look at them. Thank you again for the donation. I really appreciate that. So humble. So I personally do not know much about this company from a fundamental standpoint, but quick technicals uh, really tell me that there's a strong support here at 256 level and we're forming some type of a descending triangle here once again, like getting rejected, boom, boom, boom. And as we continue to fill in this channel, if there's enough volume, then we can see a breakout to the upside. And the resistance that it needs to break out of is going to be this level right here at close to 425 um, because that right there has been the rejection right here humble so once we see a breakout over that level that's really gonna put us back over uh, you know start trading in that uptrending channel start making higher highs go much higher than the previous high here all right so we're gonna put some more alerts on coinbase crossing over 450 crossing 300 or it's been barely gonna touch 300 crossing down over 350 so we got three alerts set up, still nothing though. 250 is still the reference price that it's showing. Uh, thank you so much, I really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Really appreciate the support. Uh, so usually IPOs begin anywhere between 11 and 12. Like this was supposed to be between 11 and 12. We'll see if that actually goes past that. Uh, but it should be reported on Bloomberg uh, pretty consistently. So let's see if we can actually find some more news. Coinbase IPO details. Let's search by the most recent news here. So indicating 360 latest. So still waiting on the first trade on Coinbase as indicated opening price still goes up. The latest is for 360. Uh, open making Coinbase on target to be worth more than NASDAQ, NYSE, and Euronext combined. Yep, 
Yeah, so we're what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep this. Uh, yeah, Patrick, I'll definitely look into Baidu. Uh, that's another stock that I definitely will look into for sure. I'm 45. It's in his NASDAQ debut. Joining us now, Bloomberg's Chanel. All right, indicated to okay, open at 359. When are we going to get it? What's the price going to be? You know, we actually have a little higher now. It's 360, making it $94 billion. <laughs> to get to that $100 billion valuation, the price would need to be around 382 and 70 cents so it's getting very close we're expecting it later in the day that's pretty typical for a direct listing two things a does the coinbase valuation then support other valuations of crypto companies and fintech companies as we know others like kraken have indicated to us their desire to go public and does it continue to validate this direct listing model as it is one of the biggest we have seen on nasdaq let alone across all the exchanges all right looking forward to it uh very exciting moment uh, for Bitcoin, it does seem. All right, Bloomberg Shalai Basic, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Joining us now for more is Julie Shariel, a Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst for FinTech and Payments. Julie, if we're looking at like a, what do you say, Shalai, $90 billion valuation? $94 billion valuation. Julie, is it worth it? Well, there's a lot more um, upside even that we can imagine this year if the company is able to maintain um, their levels of users um, and uh, the revenue per user. And so if we look at where they were in the first quarter at around 6 million users, um, even if they dip down a little bit, a little bit below that for the full year, we're still looking at about um, you know, $400 a share kind of stock based on a little over $3 billion in revenue and where multiples have been this, this time um, this year. So it doesn't really seem out of the realm of possibility given the kind of numbers they've been putting up recently. So Julie, how do they make most of their revenue and can they continue to make it in the same way? Yeah, so about 80% of revenue is your basic transaction, buying and selling of crypto. Um, and that's really driven by just the number of users they have transacting every quarter and the revenue they're getting per user, which is commissions and some additional value added services like storage um, that they're providing. That's 80%. About 20% is a growing number of services around uh, debit cards, lending, um, and um, uh, other kinds of um, uh, developer tools, working with merchants to help merchants support um, payments in crypto. So lots of things that really make this company kind of a, a crypto ecosystem kind of company, not just that 80%, which is the exchange that we're all most familiar with. Um, so can they still make the majority of their money on crypto trading, considering that uh, there are other exchanges that are cropping up? Sure, they're the first mover, but still, or at some point do they transition and make more consistent cash somewhere else? Yeah, I, mean, I think there's still plenty of, uh, of opportunity for them to continue um, down this path. And it's really just going to be driven by the increased adoption um, and interest in crypto. Right, More retail investors wanting to get on board as they just become more familiar with it and see the opportunity. And then even more importantly, more institutions getting involved. And we're very much in the early stages um, of institutional investors beginning to play in crypto and getting comfortable. Um, Tesla is the, is the main example. Tesla bought their um, their, crypt, their Bitcoin through Coinbase. Um, so they've certainly set that expectation and that reputation for themselves um, to be able to support larger institutional trades, storage for institutions, and, and showing that they are um, ahead of the game in, in many ways on compliance and regulation, working with the regulators just makes the institutions more comfortable. The regulation part is quite interesting. I was reading a piece that said um, there should be tougher regulation that's more proactive rather than really reactive, um, and that the regulators are really far behind. Even though Coinbase is working with them, um, there still needs to be a huge crackdown. How does an investor price in that kind of risk? Yeah, so, so you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword when you think about regulation and what the regulators are, are apt to do. And, and the market really just sort of took off ahead of, ahead of regulators, regulators being able to kind of catch up. 
Um, the main concern is really about protecting the retail investor um, from extreme volatility and from fraud. Um, and we do know that there have been instances of crypto being used in, you know, we'll call it more illicit um, kinds of financing. Um, and that's really what the regulators are concerned about, is eliminating that um, and keeping the average guy safe. Um, and so while they may come in and put some control, some limit on trading, on the amount of shares, on volume, which would be negative, at the same time, the fact that they're stepping in and they're making, um, they're kind of formalizing and legitimizing this market is going to mean that more investors, sick institutions, are willing to come in and play. And I think that will offset any of the potential slowdowns on the retail side from regulation. Julie, do you get a sense that um, investors who buy this are just buying a different way of buying Bitcoin that's a bit easier? Or do you get the sense that the investor base is going to be those that are really thinking of more of a decentralized financial system and this like the gateway or like some bridge to that at some point? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's definitely both, right? There are, those, there are those folks who want in on crypto, you know, have it, find it a little hard to stomach the volatility of Bitcoin and want a less volatile way to play it. Um, then there are those folks who, who are thinking even longer term um, and getting to understand what, you know, um, what decentralized finance is all about and the potential of cryptocurrencies um, as a sort of new currency platform um, and a way to make financial, trans financial transactions faster, safer, easier. Um, and that's the, that's the long-term play here. So I think you have, I think you have both camps. So what mm -hmm. you mean is, what, what, you, what that means is multiple ways of, of driving demand. Fair enough. And then high, hence the high valuation. So 360 uh, is what we're looking at right now. Julie Sherry, Bloomberg Intelligence, thanks a lot. Always fun to catch up with you. This is Bloomberg. All right, guys. So there's a lot, lot exciting stuff. So yeah, so IPO is initial public offering. I will make sure that everybody knows that they are actually, Coinbase is actually doing it direct. Uh, listing, so they're not issuing any more shares. Uh, similar to what Palantir did, but there is a 180-day, three-month lockup period um, that they're not allowed to actually sell their shares. Right, three months, actually six months. Six months, 180 days is going to be uh, six months. Uh, they're they're not allowed to uh, sell any, any shares similar to what we saw for Palantir, which basically expired in February, which is why we saw like a huge drawdown for Palantir stock of over 50%, coupled with the earnings. So there was a lot of negative catalyst for them. But Coinbase also issuing stock, existing stock, to raise capital through the markets, and of course, getting a, almost a $100 billion market cap, uh, market valuation is what we saw um, from that. So, excited, excited. I mean, there's still, they said later half of the day. So, right now it's 11.50 a.m., so there's still plenty of time for us to basically just look at the markets and, and see when, when Coinbase is gonna go public. Um, so, 360, how many buyers right now? <laughs> Raise your guys' hands at 360. 360 going once. We're probably at 370 now. We'll see. Um, I am, you know, I don't think there's going to be that much of an interest, but let's see. I think it was like the Washington here. Let me look at it very quickly on my phone so I can pull that up. To see if you can cover that, you know, it starts in six minutes, and then you know why not? So three six three on trading two one two. Yes, sir. Buy three sixty. Yeah, Doge has been absolutely killing it, right? I think it's gone up like over 150% in the last week or something. So Tesla having a little bit of a push higher. So the low for the day is 742. Now we're back over 750. Neo is down a little bit over 2% right now. Apple is still a little bit struggling over 133 as well.
All right, let's take a look. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I want to cover Jerome Powell. The Economic Club of. All right. All right. So we'll see. This is also going to be starting very very soon. What's going on? Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. Uh, no, Sabina, I don't mean that you can't. I meant insiders can't during that lockup period. So you can trade however you want. You can buy and sell whatever at any time you want. It's just the insiders have some type of a lockup period, lock period that as soon as we go public, they can't basically sell for a certain time. There are specific options that do get exercised at different times, which is what we are seeing also. Uh, from a lot of insiders for Palantir, uh, but for the retail crew like you and I, we can trade however we want. So let's take a look at what's pushing higher today. So energy up over almost four percent. We got financials up over one and a half. So let's take a look at where those Exxon Mobil and Chevron's up. Wow, look at that! Up over four percent. We got crude oil. And we got Brent up over 3.7. Exxon's up over almost 4%. Chevron's up over almost 3. Let's take a look, look at the banks. Wells Fargo. Did they report today? I think they did, right? Yeah, Wells Fargo reported. JP Morgan reported. Goldman Sachs reported. JP Morgan had a blowout quarter, but it's still down for some reason. And Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo. Look at that. Up over 5%, 4% each. PayPal and Square, of course, Square is down a little bit over 3%, 3.8 as well. We'll kind of tune in on this as well. Um, again, not really too interested on this. Of course, there's going to be stuff that he's going to be talking about. A lot of it is going to be reiterated many, many times. We've already heard uh, from Jerome Powell. But we'll see. We'll see if there's any new information that we can gather from this. But we do have our alerts set up for Coinbase at different prices. So as soon as it does go live, those will get triggered, hopefully, if the volatility is there. And I've gotten $50 marks. So 350 400 450 I don't think I have it at 500 We might as well just add one. You never know. Can you see this on Weeble? Sell says 250 here on Weeble. Yeah, Weeble still says 250. Robinhood, I believe, still says 250 as well. So trading may not be available till the middle of the day. So it's almost 12. How many of you guys are actually excited about Coinbase? And how many of you guys are, you know, don't care about Coinbase as a company? When Coin released today, um, around midday, we'll see like hopefully after 12 p.m. Still nothing here. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Rubenstein, President of the Economic Club of Washington, D.C. Hello, I'm David Rubenstein, President of the Economic Club of Washington, D.C. 
And I'd like to welcome everybody to our 17th virtual event of our 35th season. Today, our special guest is the Honorable Jerome H. Powell, Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Uh, before I begin the interview of uh, Chairman Powell, I'd just like to re recognize a few special guests, our international ambassadors who are with us. Uh, Ambassador Ashok Murpuri, Ambassador of Singapore. Rosemary Banks, Ambassador of New Zealand. Philip Etienne, Ambassador of France. Juan de Dion. So we'll kind of tune in to that once again. Um, can you walk us through on how to get your charts? So, so that's a great question. So you don't have to purchase them. All you have to do is be a member of our Patreon. If you do that, all these will be available to you every month. Um, and the interesting thing is that the links will be provided to you. And once you click on them, the entire analysis, and I mean everything, like all these different trend lines, will be automatically syncing over to your charts as well. So all you have to do is be a part of it. The link, again, is going to be down in the description below for our Patreon. And if you are a member, you will get access to these charts, get access to the private Discord as well. Um, and there's also different tiers if you want one-on-one -on -one Zoom meetings with myself, uh, once a month we do that we also have private live streams that we do like every other weekend or every other week for the members of our patreon and in that video like we covered 30 35 stocks from a technical standpoint right something like stocks that i don't even cover on these live streams those are all covered on the private live streams for all of our members so again the link is going to be down in the description below uh, for those private live streams as well so i'm excited Gonna be my first investment in crypto stuff. That's awesome. Congratulations. Ever more widespread vaccinations with strong fiscal policy, with continued support for monetary policy. You see the economy opening. You can see ridership on airplanes going up and people going back to restaurants. I think the March jobs report that we recently got uh, shows what that can look like, which was close to a million jobs in a month. So I think we are we're going into a period of faster growth and higher job creation, and that, that's a good thing. I would point out there's still risks. In particular, I would say the main risk is that we'll have another uh, spike in, in cases, perhaps in, a, uh, in one of the virus strains that may be more difficult to uh, to treat. Now, we don't see that yet. We do see cases having moved up a bit, but that's something we need to be careful about, and I think we'd be wise to to keep wearing masks and being socially distant at least for a while longer. Okay. Uh, when the Fed does uh, its analysis of the economy, you now have to look at things like vaccination rates. Do you uh, have internal experts that give you that kind of information of whether the vaccination rates is going uh, the way it's supposed to, or do you consult outside people for that kind of information? Well, we do have experts now. I would tell you a year ago, we, uh, we, you know, we had to learn it. You know, so this was the, by far the most important economic policy in this entire event has been medical policy. It's been the treatment of the disease and, and the success of measures to suppress its spread and then ultimately vaccination. So that's been the most important driver of the economy. Uh, we, of course, all through this have consulted externally with lots of experts. But we've also developed significant in-house expertise over the course of now more than a year. So we do monitor that still very, very carefully, uh, of course. So let's talk about the president's uh, stimulus bill, the $1.9 uh, trillion dollar stimulus bill. Um, at the time that it was proposed, uh, Larry Summers, a former secretary of the Treasury, said that he thought it might be too big and might be somewhat inflationary. It was uh, the output gap is roughly $500 billion. This was $1.9 trillion. Uh, you, I believe, supported the, uh, the uh, legislation, thought it was appropriate for the economy. Do you have any concern that we are going to be reducing inflation as a result of the stimulus bill, or do other things that might get you uh, to be more worried about the economy because of the size of that stimulus bill? So we, um, at the Fed, we have very specific jobs. We're a creature of statute, and we have very specific jobs that we handle on the, that Congress has given us, and that's for monetary policy. It's stable prices and maximum employment. We also supervise and regulate banks. We deal with the payment systems and all that. One thing we don't do is give Congress or the administration advice on fiscal policy. So I've never, and, and we don't uh, traditionally, take a position in favor or opposed to legislation. We didn't do that for the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, and we didn't do it for really any of these uh, these acts. Uh, you know, uh, 
that's just not something that we do. We have a narrow mandate and precious independence, so uh, we, we try to stay in our lane and not comment on, on things that Congress might do on fiscal policy. Okay. Well, let's just talk about, let me try it another way. Are you worried about debt and deficits? Uh, if the debt is uh, pretty high. That's a big concern. That's so, a really valid concern. And the annual deficit is now about two and a half to three trillion or so. Um, is that a concern to the Fed in terms of impacting inflation? So yes, in, in the um, over time and in the longer run, the U.S. federal budget is on an unsustainable path, meaning simply that the debt is growing meaningfully faster than the economy, and that's by definition unsustainable over time. It's a different thing to say that the current level of the debt is unsustainable. It's not. The current level of the debt is very sustainable, and there's no question of our ability to service and, and issue that debt for the foreseeable future. Um, I would also say, though, that as a, as a nation, we, we will have to eventually get back to a sustainable path. That is something that is best done in very good times, when the economy is at full employment and when taxes are rolling in. This is not the time to prioritize that concern, but it is nonetheless an important concern that I believe we will ultimately have to return to, again, when the economy is strong. Now, you have previously said, I just want to ask you if you feel the same way now, that currently you do not expect the Federal Reserve to increase interest rates before the end of 2022. Is that a correct view of uh, what you've said? So here's what we've said. We've said that we would expect to keep interest rates where they are today until three particular outcomes are achieved in the economy. The first is that the recovery in the labor market is effectively complete. The second is that inflation has reached 2% and really reached it, not just sort of tapped the base, as I like to say, but has reached sustainably. And the third thing is that inflation is on track to run moderately above 2% for some time. Those are the tests. So we are really focused on the progress of the economy toward those goals and not on a particular time frame. When we get those three boxes checked, that's when we'll consider raising interest rates and that's when we'll, that's when we'll raise interest rates. Until then, we won't. So what you're referring to, I think, is we all write down these projections every quarter in the March, June, September, and December FOMC meetings, write down individual projections, and we submit those, we tabulate them, and publish them. And most, most members of the committee did not see raising interest rates until 2024, but that isn't a committee forecast. It isn't something we vote on or, or act on as a group. It really is just our own uh, assessment. And uh, so I, I think there's a tendency of markets to to focus too much on the on what we call the dot plot, the summary of economic projections, and uh, I, I would focus more on on the outcomes that we've described and and uh, as the, the best assessment we can make of our progress toward achieving those. Okay, but based on what you know today, uh, you would not expect to increase interest rates before 2022, or you're just not saying that yet. Well, before 2020, that would be this year. I think that would be highly unlikely. I, 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 I don't, I don't talk about particular right. date. I don't think there's any use in that. So, but it, it really is outcome based. Okay. Let me ask you. Uh, last time, the it's funny how with all these interviews, the whole game is to try to extrapolate as much information, because we already know what Jerome Powell's answer is going to be. But it's always this game that these people are playing to try to get as much information out. Right? It's pretty crazy. Trades and then shrink the balance sheet later, or would you begin to shrink the balance sheet and then increase interest rates? Do you have any view on whether one policy or the other is better? So what we did after the global financial crisis was, first we, uh, we were buying assets and then we, we gradually slowed the pace at which we were buying treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, and then we held the balance sheet constant for a while. After that, we started raising interest rates. We raised them gradually. And at some point, we actually, and we held the balance sheet constant. So we don't sell bonds into the market. And we, we either, when they mature, we either reinvestment or that we allow them to, to run off. So that's what we did last time. I think if you look at the sense of our guidance, it is that we, we, will, reach, we will reach the time at which we will taper asset purchases when we've made substantial further progress toward our goals from last December when we announced that guidance. And that would, that would in all likelihood be before, well before the time we consider raising interest rates. We, we haven't, you know, voted on that order, but that is the sense of the guidance is that it would work in that way. In other words, uh, you, you are likely to follow the same policy of not selling into the market the bonds you already have, 
or other securities, but just let them um, <laughs> mature, and then that, that's the way you, you uh, shrink your balance sheet. Is that right? You know, th these are questions which lie ahead of us, but essentially, though, I, I would say it this way. We, the first thing we do is we, we say that we will gradually reduce the pace of our purchases, and then when, when, when the purchases go to zero, the, the size of the balance sheet is constant, and when bonds mature, you reinvest them. Now, then another step, and we took this late in, late in the day, the last cycle, was to allow bonds to start to run off. And we haven't decided whether to do that or not. We, it, it, we didn't then, and I, I don't think we now would ever actually sell bonds into the marketplace. Okay, um, let me ask you a little bit about the FOMC. People probably don't really know how it works that, that much, but how many members are there of the FOMC? So the, all 12 reserve bank presidents and all of the sitting governors, which is currently six, are what we call participants in the FOMC. So it's the Federal Open Market Committee, and we meet eight times a year. We're doing it virtually now, uh, and, but I do it from this uh, beautiful boardroom we have upstairs. Uh, so all of the governors vote at every meeting. That's the six of us. And then five of the reserve bank presidents vote on a rotating basis, on a two- or three-year cycle, depending on which uh, on, on which. Uh, district you represent, except the New York, the New York Fed president always votes as well. So it's a little bit complicated, but the sense of it is that it's a balance between the reserve banks, which are all around the country, and the board, which is here in Washington D.C. and it's nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Okay. So in the Supreme Court, when they have conferences among the members, I think the Chief Justice gives his view first, and others, according to seniority, give their views. How does it work at the FOMC? Does the chairman of the board, you, give your views first, or do others speak and then you give your views? Yeah, it really depends I'll kinda, on the issues and, and, and what we're talking about. I'll keep this I'll keep this on, but let's just look at something else, because this is like we already know like a lot of it a lot of it stuff like him talking about the national debt, the deficits, the plot, the dot plot, uh, the interest rate hike in the future, like this has all been covered. These are just questions that are coming up once again. I'll go over that. It's a one hour event, I'll go over that after it ends go and watch it on 2x and then kind of cover if there's anything new that he basically says about the markets and then of course like the markets are not really pricing anything in uh, just yet because s and is flat QQQ is flat um, and Coinbase is still <laughs> nothing just yet $250 uh, is the is the reference price is still showing and trading of course there's nothing really there we've got the alert set up and uh, so yeah I mean the Nasdaq is down pretty significantly compared with the S&P 500 because that value trade is picking back once again. So yeah, all right, let's take a look at how many people we have watching. Um, all right, so a little bit over 380 there. So again, make sure that you guys drop a like. It really helps out the channel in a tremendous way. We've got 132 likes right now. Let's see if we can get it to at least like 250. Let's see if we can actually get, get if we can beat Coinbase's IPO price, right? Let's see if we can get up to 370 likes. Um, pretty much that's going to be all of you guys <laughs> to drop a like. Uh, Amazon correction, definitely it's, it was a little bit overbought. Uh, it was pushing higher, very, very high. So they're also covering... Jerome Powell speaking. Does it say 366 reference on Webull app? Because it still shows 250 here, and I'm looking at my phone as well, and it still shows 250 on there. You can only like once. Yes, I know. Uh, so yeah, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I mean, so Earl says, please read the Guardian about the article on deficit spending, national debt crises. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's a pretty big issue. I mean, I've, I've covered that, you know, in a separate video going over. This is one of the biggest risks to the U.S. markets and the economy. Uh, Jerome Powell also mentions that how this is an unsustainable path. And I agree. I mean, if your debt is growing much faster than your productivity and your GDP, it's not a sustainable path, right? At one point, it's going to get to a level where it's like very, very uh, overblown, right? Right now, we're seeing over 100% debt to GDP ratio. We're on track to hitting 200% in the future if debt levels continue to go up and deficit spending is also going up. And there's only two ways you can actually reduce that is by either increasing your tax revenue or reducing your spending, right? If you reduce your spending, the cost of living comes down. There's not so much healthcare, defense spending, education, uh, so on and so forth in the United States. So spending is already up there. The only way they can actually do that or finance this deficit is by increasing tax revenues. This is where uh, the global taxation, the corporate tax rate hike, the employment, uh, individual tax hikes kind of come into question. And that's what we're seeing uh, from a macro standpoint in the US economy, right? So, and then there's a question, well, whether you increase taxes or risk migration, or you don't increase taxes and you risk the debt level going out of control. So, you know, I've mentioned this in my previous videos, running an economy, and focusing on so many different things is almost very, very challenging. It's one of the most difficult things to do because one small piece of the puzzle has so many ripple effects across the economy that it's very challenging. You know, you have to think about so many different things and how it's going to affect each and every single piece of the economy. So 374 is what we're hearing. Uh, let me close this out and reopen Weeble here. Three seventy three on e Toro. So Coinbase, yeah, I think that was previous news. So yeah, I mean it still shows two fifty here. I don't know why, but all right, Coinbase indicated to open at three sixty four. So let's go over to this past hour. Prepares for a $100 billion valuation here. Coinbase employee, that, I mean, that's, if you think about it, that's a pretty um, exciting event for any company, right? For any employee, if you've been working there for like, you know, eight years, 10 years, and if your company actually goes public, um, So let's see if we can actually find any type of a timestamp on exactly where it's going. Let me see what Powell said over there. So unemployment can go low without triggering inflation. That's true. I mean, if people don't spend their money, even if unemployment's low, every, every, even if everyone's employed, they're earning money, but if they don't spend it um, on things that they usually do, then there's not gonna be any inflation. Um, there's only three things people can do. They can save, invest, or spend, right? So if they do if they do like investing and saving, there's not enough spending, so we could see inflation, while at the same time we see like an increase in asset prices uh, for real estate, for stocks, for bonds, for fixed income, for cryptos. But if they don't invest, don't save, and start spending, then we don't have any asset inflation, but we have commodity inflation, or we have regular inflation for prices for commodities, right? So where the money flows, is gonna be really the driving factor in what we see in the, in, in the future. Guys, I will be right back. I'm just gonna grab some water. Um, I'll be right back, all right?
All right, sorry about that. So, still nothing, right? It has to perhaps send that candidate to be a, a governor over to meet with the Fed chair. Strictly in their discretion to do that or not, but they have often done that, and, and, and then the Fed chair, really, they're not asking you to identify people. They're saying, is this person okay? And, and you, know, you, you sort of have a nice interview with them and, <laughs> Somebody and give them your answer. Why. So that's the way it's well, been traditionally, but really we have no official role and it's completely up to the administration whether they want to do that or not. So I don't think we've ever had a case where a chairman of the Fed later became secretary of the Treasury. All right. All right, let's take a look at some other stocks here, all right? GameStop now up over 19%. Trading as us 167 here. We got C3I up over 13%. AMC is up over 18, uh, 8%. LABU is up over 12%. It's a biotech ETF. By the way, what do you guys think about the biotech sector here? Like the biotech sector has just been selling off pretty aggressively. Like if you were to look at XBI. So this is the biotech sector, right? It's just been selling off from highs of like 174. Had a 27% drop. And this is like, ooh, we will alert. Somebody says... Oh, there we go. I did no nothing. Still nothing. Alert Coinbase at three sixty six. Twelve twenty-five, midday. We're gonna wait till one p.m. <laughs> then I'm gonna pretty much go to bed after that because I'll have my order set. If it does get executed, great. If it doesn't, not a problem. So Tesla making some type of recovery here, down just about half a percent, and so is Neo. Uh, Apple's still kind of out there, Palantir. Voyager, that's a great question, Lucas. I'm going to actually take a look at Voyager myself. I've heard about what it's like to be the chairman of the Fed. You know, one day you're, you know, again Powell just stealing all the, all the light away from coinbase i thought it was coinbase thought it was their day it was their one day where they could just like ipo and just all the eyes would be on them and then powell comes around and he's like i will always be the star of the show <laughs> so nasdaq really uh underperforming the SP now and pounds you're also making some type of recovery so that's good down just over one percent But overall, it's a, it's a pretty red day, like Facebook, Netflix, Fiverr Square, Shopify, PayPal. But this is, again, very normal because we've seen a lot of those stocks kind of rally, right? Squ Square, we were talking about it when it was at 200 Shopify at around $1,000. PayPal around 225 CCIV is also down a little bit. Let's take a look at the EV sector here very quickly. So EV sector, we've got ride and Nikola outperforming the entire Nasdaq today what do you guys think about that <laughs> ride Lordstorm Motors and Nikola outperforming well there there goes Nikola now down in the red but Lordstorm Motors outperforming the entire EV sector that's got to be something The Jerome Powell interview is so boring. I agree. I mean, it's not—it's not really much new information that they're talking about. It's mostly um, 
all stuff. But I'll still go over it. Uh, I mean, there's definitely going to be some important things that we need to go over um, that he's going to be talking about. But for the most part, Lordstown taking the charge in the EV sector. Commodities. So U.S. oil already is up, we know. So energy sector is up. Platinum, silver. Gold is still down and palladium is also down a little bit. Some of those infrastructure companies, somebody mentioned Vail. Isn't that like, a, yeah, right here. So it's up over 4%. It's funny because it was on my infrastructure watch list. I did see that comment somewhere. Vail doing really well today. Yep. So yeah, up over 4%. It's an infrastructure play. I think they do like transportation or for like materials or something, right? Year to date, it's up over uh, close to 13%. So again, infrastructure play there for Vail. I want to still keep this on coin. Uh, it should be on Robinhood, but it's not yet live. So that's why we're not able to 364 on Market Watch. Let's see if we can find any more new updates on it. So, all right. Users, 2.8 million transactions monthly, 322 million hours after losing tens of million in 2019. But the thing is, they're like they're super profitable here. That's the thing. Like their EPS is gonna be huge if they continue to kind of build on those revenues. Their gross margins over 60%, and their net margins over 44%. Like almost almost half of their revenue gets translated down to the bottom line. Very few companies actually do that and let alone like in the 100 billion market cap like tier very few companies are able to generate that type of net income um the only the only issue with them is sustainability right how long is this sustainable for them so i'm really really excited for this but the valuation needs to kind of align with the analysis as well like yep veil is mining too so so that's good to know Um, so Baidu's up over 1.7 Corsair finally is up over 2.7% here um, Lemonade up over 2% Q2, QTWO Q2 holdings something that we covered in one of our recent videos um, 100 under $100 I feel like this is going to be a really strong buy uh, this stock is actually down substantially like over I believe 30-35% um Pinterest has been on a tear as well, up over 1.23%. Um, Enphase up over 1.2%. We've got Visa also up, IPOE. QuantumScape's up, ARKG is finally up back over $90, up over 1.8% because of biotech pushing higher. Um, NNDM, Fubo TV are also up, Caterpillar, uh, CVS. Are green as well so mostly tech it's been mostly tech and a little bit of a healthcare and evs of course kind of underperforming the market could be a reason why the u.s 10-year yields are up a little bit over one one and a half percent so
So still nothing. What do you guys see? What do you guys see that I don't see right now? Are there any any prices beyond 370? Is 370 is kind of like the last read we got for the prices uh, for for Coinbase. But I see the same price um, on Webull as I see on Robinhood. TradingView doesn't show anything yet. There's no trading data, but we do have our alerts set up for for Coinbase here. Hello, hello, thank you for joining in. I really appreciate that. Yes, Bitcoin literally skyrocketed in Q1. Won't happen again and again. Couldn't agree more there. So really need, we need to see some type of um, pivot from Coinbase. They need to adapt to a more different market environment. Spending, saving, sort of lending products, that need, really needs to kind of kick in. Because their user base is really high. Like, Square, Cash App, like, compared with those and even Venmo, like compared with those platforms, Coinbase has a really strong user base. Um, Al, so Fed, Jerome Powell is actually speaking right now as we're doing this live stream. It's just that we're not watching it because there's other interesting stuff also that's going on. So this right here is the actual meeting that's going on. Um, and supervision that they need is really there. Well, related to that would be cryptocurrencies, which is not quite fintech. Maybe some people might say it is, but cryptocurrencies have blossomed, mushroomed, uh, uh, depending on your observation of uh, the size of it. It's hard to know exactly how big it is. Are you worried about the impact on, of cryptocurrencies in terms of the impact in the economy and the ability of people to use these things for nefarious purposes? So a couple things. With We think of them more as crypto assets because we're, Crypto, what people call cryptocurrencies, they're really vehicles for speculation. No one is using them for payments, for example, like the dollar. What they're using them for is to speculate. It's, like, it's a little bit like gold. For, you know, for thousands of years, human beings have, have given gold this special value that it doesn't have from an industrial standpoint. But nonetheless, for thousands of years, they've done that. So Bitcoin is much more like that. The cryptocurrencies are much more like that. They're not, they're not really being uh, actively used as payments. Let me ask you uh, about your own balance sheet. I didn't really follow up before. What is You're the size saying. of the Fed? All right, guys, unfortunately, I may be live once again if this thing does come live trading. But right now, it's a little past 10 p.m. You guys already know when those videos come out at 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning. So I usually do have to wake up very, very super early to put those videos out. So so I'm going to cut it right here. But if if coin starts trading and you know if if we actually see the live stream at around 1 30 1 30 p.m or 2 p.m eastern i'll try to be live around that time as well but thank you so much for joining in to give you guys a very quick update right now as of the latest number 370 375 puts the valuation well over 90 billion dollars my buy price my preferred buy target is under 300 um 350 to like 400 is kind of chasing it a little bit and paying that heavy premium if you fundamentally believe in the long-term outlook of cryptos and bitcoin and the sustainability of Coinbase as a company to pivot into some of those other services and uh, and uh, like those other subscription models and services as well. Um, so <laughs> it's a little bit past 10 p.m. and usually I do have to like, I try to do them a little bit earlier, but again, I have to wake up super, super early in order for me to put out content for you guys. So. You know, that's that's the only reason. So again, thank you so much for joining in. I may be live once again if this thing starts trading uh, and then kind of go over the patterns, the one minute, the five minute, and the daily, of course, is gonna be a very simple candle. We'll kind of look at the volume as well. Uh, but right now, again, 250 is kind of the reference point. Don't go off of that because that's just there uh, as a placeholder, so to speak, and the prices are gonna be much, much higher when they actually do start trading. <laughs> yes, that's right, Jason. That curse has broken. So every time I do go to bed, the markets have been pushing higher. So that's actually good. So we'll see if Coinbase actually does follow through with that. So again, thank you so much for joining in. I really, really do appreciate you guys' support. I may be live once again, so keep a close eye on that. Um, and if it starts trading once again, so I'll get some rest. Uh, you guys also have a great, fantastic day. I wish you guys nothing but the best um, and a green, green day today and rest of the week. Uh, and we'll talk again you know, later today and tomorrow and for the rest of the rest of the year. So uh, have a good day and I uh, will see you guys in the next next live stream.